So I'd like to introduce Kim Burns and John Axe. I'm not sure who's going to go first, uh, who will introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Okay, I'll go first. Um, uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Martin Cohn. He's a professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology at UF. And his research is focused around congenital malformations of external genitalia. Uh, he, ha he has a BA from University of Texas in Austin, an MA from Kent State University, and his PhD is from University College in London. Uh, he has a bunch of awards, including a 2018 Basic Science Research Award from, from the UF College of Medicine, and another one for postdoctoral mentoring award, also for, from the University of Florida in 2013. Uh, and so now I will turn this over to, to Ken to say a few more words, who, because Ken knows Marty personally. Right, it was a pleasure. <laughs> he was one of the bright lights, or is one of the bright lights in the Genetics Institute uh, when I was the director. And uh, so I got to know him pretty well. Uh, I was particularly uh, pleased because Mari turns out to be the first and probably the only person to be awarded a Howard Hughes Research Investigators Award uh, as, a, as a young faculty person here. And uh, his work is extremely well regarded. I, talked informally after the selection to one or two members of the committee who were old friends. And I said, wow, we were blown away. I <laughs> thought it was great. And so, uh, as Marty says, uh, a lot of his work has to do with sex. And I suspect that'll be involved in today's talk. And that seems to excite sufficient public interest. So. Marty, I'm going to let you turn you loose and let you do your thing. Okay, thank you. And while I'm getting started, I'll tell you what you're looking at. Um, so we study lower urinary tract development specifically, and I've become more broadly interested in sex interests, uh, sex differences in general. And um, what you're looking at here is, um, let me get back to the beginning. So these are nanoscale CT scans. Uh, using a relatively new instrument at UF. This was actually done by one of my undergraduates. It's a, uh, I'm sorry. It's a human, it's a lower urinary tract of a, of a human uh, fetus. Uh, you're looking at the kidneys here and the ureters coming down into the bladder. You're gonna see this uh, appendage sticking out here a lot today. That's the external genitalia, the penis, uh, the same embryonic precursor. And the embryo gives rise to the penis and the clitoris. Uh, through an NIDDK uh, grant that we've had. Actually, we just were renewed for the third time. So we're now in years 11 to 15. We're working on an atlas in the style of um, a real atlas like uh, Gray's Anatomy. I don't know if you can see me at all. But this is an atlas that goes from the anatomical level down to the molecular level of um, urinary tract development, and it was initially uh, the original vision for this before we got involved was for this to, to, to be a, an atlas of mouse genitourinary development. Um, and then during one of the rounds of funding, it was expanded to humans. And so we started imaging lower urinary tract development in the human. And so this is, I like to start with this image because it's such a beautiful animation. Uh, it's a reconstructed, series of slices from a CAT scan, this nanoscale CAT scan. And then the density of these different structures is different enough that they can be um, digitally segmented. So you can see different structures. You're looking at the urethra in orange going up to the developing prostate in blue, the ureters, and then Julia Bittencourt, the student, has made sort of a fly-through. So you can actually uh, take a trip through uh, from the tip of the urethra all the way back through the pelvic part of the urethra and up to the prostate and into the bladder. And so we've generated a lot of these resources, some of which I'll talk about today, for the research and clinical urology community uh, 
and they can all be viewed at a website that's called GUDMAP, G-U-D-M-A-P dot org, that stands for the Genital Urinary Development Molecular Anatomy Project. Uh, and if you didn't get that, I have a slide that will tell you a bit about it. So thank you for inviting me to speak. And um, I haven't been giving many seminars over the past year um, intentionally, but um, I told John as soon as he said, Ken Burns recommended me. I said, that's my, that's my Achilles heel. I'll do anything for Ken. Ken has been a tremendous supporter uh, of, of my lab and our research from the outset. And although he said I'm the first and maybe the only Howard Hughes investigator, it's not entirely true. Ken is modest enough that he wouldn't mention that he was a Howard Hughes investigator many years before I came to the university. I'm not sure if that was even at the University of Florida, but Ken was a, a Howard Hughes investigator. Um, so it, it was an honor to be in that club. What I'm gonna talk about today is how sex differences are established uh, during embryonic development. Um, not only in the genitalia, we generally think about sex differences in the context of genitalia, testes and ovaries, and the external genitalia. But there are a lot of organs that have sex differences, which are known as sexual dimorphisms, um, some of which I've actually learned about relatively recently, and some you may not be aware of. So the obvious differences, as I mentioned, in the internal and external genitalia, but there are sex differences in the musculoskeletal system, uh, in skin, in hair, in digits, our fingers and toes, secondary sex characters like mammary glands um, in the brain. And more recently, we've started looking at some entirely non-reproductive organs like the lungs and the liver, spleen, and bladder, which is kind of a remarkable feat if you think about it. How is the sex of multiple organ systems coordinated in an individual? And as you're probably aware, just from reading the newspaper, that it isn't always coordinated within an individual. There are <clears throat> um, many people who um, display uh, dissociated uh, uh, sexual dimorphisms, where there will be aspects of their anatomy or physiology that is more male-like and aspects that are more, more female-like, including in the brain. So I will start at the beginning. <clears throat> so you're probably, if you go back to you know, intro biology, we'll remember that um, sex is established in mammals by different complements of sex chromosomes. Males have an X and a Y, and females have two X chromosomes. And there is a single gene on the Y chromosome. Uh, it's called SRY. It is the sex determining gene, it was discovered in the 90s. And that single gene is all that's needed for male uh, sex determination. That gene is switched on in the embryonic gonad and it turns on this cascade of, uh, of other genes. It represses some of the genes that are necessary to make an ovary. And it's SRY that establishes the uh, fate of the gonad as a testis. And you can take an XX mouse and give it that one gene, SRY, and that is sufficient to make that mouse develop as a male. Um, there's been a lot of focus on sex determination, um, the role of SRY and how the gonads differentiate in the testes and, and ovaries. Uh, and that is the focus of that discipline of, of genetics that focuses on sex determination, but there's a lot more to sex determination beyond the, uh, the gonads, the testes and the ovaries. It's the gonads that synthesize sex hormones. There are other tissues that synthesize sex hormones, but primarily testis and ovary. And it's the sex hormones that really regulates development of all of these other organ systems uh, into male or female-like characters. And we know surprisingly little about how this works. So about 75 years ago, some classic experiments by um, a geneticist called uh, Jost, who established this paradigm that has really stood until the past few years, that all sex differences are controlled 
by the presence or absence of testosterone. Um, what genes does testosterone regulate? We don't know much about that. Um, what uh, uh, genes do estrogen and progesterone regulate? Don't know much about that either. Um, we do know that it's important because in a lot of diseases such as cancers of the reproductive organs, like prostate cancer, breast cancer, those cancers are fed by sex hormones. And the first line of defense is to really cut off that signaling um, pharmacologically by effectively chemical castration to shut off testosterone fueling prostate cancer growth. And there has been a good amount of progress in understanding the genetics of those cancers. But during development, there's just not been a lot known. And I think it's probably because people who study embryonic development, uh, like me, are geneticists. Uh, not that concerned about what happens after the genetic regulation of the uh, sex of the gonads is concerned. And so we're really left with this sort of curious um, gap in our understanding of what happens between synthesis of hormones by the gonads and development of male and female sex characters. And it reminds me of this old comic strip that I've modified, it was a physics cartoon, um, you turn on testosterone and estrogen, uh, you end up with a male and a female, and then a miracle occurs. And uh, his colleague says, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. And this is an old cartoon, but it's, it's, you know, unfortunately still applicable to this problem. So that's what I want to talk to you about today is uh, trying to fill in this gap in our understanding. And my lab has taken kind of an interdisciplinary approach to understanding uh, genitourinary development and sex development. I am a developmental biologist. I was originally trained in evolution as an anthropologist. And um, changes that occur over evolutionary time uh, have to be encoded in the genome and executed during embryonic development. If you're going to change anatomical form, that has to happen when the anatomical form is being sculpted. And so this intersection or overlap of evolution and development has become its own subdiscipline, uh, in which investigators are primarily interested in understanding the developmental mechanisms that drive evolutionary change. Uh, disease, though, also has an important developmental component. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going to show you what happens when uh, the genetics of development signaling, cell signaling during development goes awry and results in a set of developmental diseases that are congenital malformations or structural birth defects. But it's also becoming clear that changes to development um, can have effects later in life. And there are developmental origins of adult diseases. And there's not a lot known about that. And so we're interested in how these um, different uh, spheres uh, overlap. And what can we learn about the developmental basis of evolution and disease and what can we learn about development from studying different organisms and uh, different disease uh, phenotypes? And so one of those that I'm going to talk to you about a fair bit today is a malformation of the external genitalia. It's called hypospadias. It's, a congen it's defined as a congenital malformation of the penis characterized by incomplete closure of the urethral tube. But I should say from the outset that it can affect males and females. It's not reported as often in females because it's much more difficult to diagnose, whereas you don't need fancy imaging <coughs> technology to look at this uh, newborn boy and realize there's something wrong. And what's wrong is that the urethra has not opened as it should at the tip of the penis. It, it's a failure of urethral tube closure. So you can have a completely splayed open uh, urethra, you can have an offset urethral meatus here, you can have multiple holes. And in this panel of newborn boys with hypospadias, uh, they're ordered in increasing severity. Here's a urethra that opens right in the middle of the shaft. Um, it can be opened down to the scrotum. And in these two kids, E and F, they really have ambiguous genitalia. Uh, the obstetrician would be challenge to tell the parent whether just based on genital anatomy, whether they had a new baby boy or a new baby girl. The genetics that cause this malformation is very poorly understood. Uh, in fact, 
the overwhelming majority of the kids who are screened for mutations in candidate genes um, come back as normal. And so the cause of this is not really known. The, the prevalence is very high. It's about one in 125 to one in 130 uh, live male births. I have some kind of a urethral tube defect that's second only to cardiac defects. Um, the, the incidence worldwide has more than doubled over the past 50 years without explanation. Um, it's faster than mutations can move through a population. So there's been growing interest in the role of environmental factors, chemicals in the environment that can affect endocrine signaling, such as uh, antagonizing the receptor for testosterone, the androgen receptor, or mimicking estrogen uh, activity. So I'm going to break this talk into a few small sections. And in the first section, I want to talk to you about the molecular genetics, uh, the molecular mechanisms that uh, we think underlie some uh, cases of hypospadias, or at least can induce hypospadias in mouse models. <laughs> so first I need to introduce you to the mouse um, genitalia. So you're looking at a 10 and a half day mouse embryo. You're just looking at the tail end. So this is viewing it under the electron microscope. Here's the tail. Uh, the legs will form here and here. You're looking at the belly side. This is the umbilicus sticking out. And these two small humps of cells that I've labeled genital swellings will grow together to form this bud of cells that's known as the genital bud or the genital tubercle. And in the middle of that is a small sheet of cells that will form the tube. So this is about halfway through mouse development. They're born at about 21 days. About 14 or so days into mouse development, you see that that bud has developed some other buds. They're sort of bud, in a Dr. Seuss-like fashion, buds on buds on buds. So on either side of this genital bud, you have these additional buds. They're called the prepucial buds or the prepucial swellings. They will grow out uh, laterally and envelop the glands to form the prepuce or the foreskin, or in a female, the hood around the clitoris. And this is the glands of the penis or the glands of the clitoris. Then down here at the base, another set of buds, those are called the labioscrotal swellings. And they will, as the name suggests, remain unfused to form the labia of female external genitalia, or they'll fuse and form the scrotum, as you can see here. And in a male, that hole will close and a new hole will open later in development at the tip, which is the outlet for the urethra. And in a female, that will stay open and will form the vaginal opening. And even at birth, unless you've looked at a lot of mouse external genitalia, which you know, my mother's proud to say that I have, uh, the male and the female external genitalia are not obviously different certainly not as different as they are in a human. They will become much more different, but I wanna point out a couple of differences to you. If we just take a section through the uh, penis and the clitoris of the mouse and look at that histological section here, what you see is the tube of the urethra is dead center and completely enclosed by all of this connective tissue and by the foreskin. And in the female, it's a cleft <clears throat> on the underside that remains a cleft. When they hit puberty, the differences are really pronounced because you get this differential growth um, and the anatomical differences are much more similar to what you see in other uh, mammals, including humans, the male and the female. All right, so how do you study the genetic control of the developmental processes that form male and female external genitalia? Well, to study genetics, you need genes. And I have to say, when we started this project, it was just, it was a couple of years before I moved from England to Gainesville, uh, there was at the time one gene that had been described in the embryo as being expressed, meaning turned on in that genital region. You know, there's only so much that you can do with one gene. You really need some, some tools uh, to work with to try and understand how the system is patterned, but we didn't even know what genes were being turned on in this system. 
And so this is a great, I think this is a great University of Florida and Genetics Institute story. Um, the month uh, after I moved here, I discovered that another uh, guy had moved here to start up his lab in a different department by the name of Brian Harfey. He also studied limb development, which I had studied. Um, and he had made a mouse, a transgenic mouse, when he was a postdoc at Harvard, in which he knocked in this jellyfish fluorescent protein, it's called green fluorescent protein. He knocked it into a gene that was turned on in the limbs. And you can see this view of a mouse embryo, there's green fluorescence where the fingers and the toes will form. And I asked Brian, I knew this gene, the gene's called sonic hedgehog, we had been studying it and the genitalia, it was most famous for its role in finger and toe development. I asked Brian, you know, do your mice have green fluorescent penises? And he said, I don't know, which I found incomprehensible. How do you not know if your mouse, uh, if its penis is, is not fluorescent? So we went down to Brian's lab and took a look at his mice. And right in between the legs, there was this beautiful stripe of green fluorescence. And if you dissect off the genital tubercle, you can see that it's uh, green fluorescence is throughout the middle of that structure, well, that's the urethra. And so as a sidebar, Brian and I started doing some work together. We wrote some grants together. Ken was getting ready to complete the construction of the Genetics Institute and was looking across three colleges to figure out who would be suitable for this new building. And Brian and I were in different departments and different colleges at the time, and we were collaborating. And um, I guess Ken thought we were good candidates to move in together, and we did. We opened up a joint lab in the genetics building, which is where I am currently located. Brian's now an associate dean for research. Um, but moving into this building really had an important impact on the trajectories of both of our research because it put two people together and allowed us to work together um, in, in this very collegial and collaborative environment. And one of the experiments that we did was we do, took these genitalia from Brian's mice and we put them through a, an instrument that sorts cells based on fluorescence and it allowed us to purify all of the green fluorescent cells. In other words, all of the urethral cells. And a student of mine had done some really old fashioned uh, cut and paste embryology where you just take pieces of tissue and move them around in the embryo and had discovered that this group of cells is uh, has a very powerful effect on development of the genitalia, it is known as an organizer. It communicates to other cells and tells them where they are in three-dimensional space. It establishes the coordinates within that structure. It was a critical signaling region. So we were really interested in learning more about the biology of this group of cells. Here they are uh, sorted out from the rest of the, the cells. And then we used the technology that's now been superseded um, by higher throughput uh, transcriptomics. At the time, you could extract the RNA from these cells and uh, use something called a microarray, which was a chip, and determine all of the genes that were expressed in that group of cells. And we went from knowing about one gene expressed in the genitalia to 88 genes that we were able to validate. And if you look at, these are uh, preparations of the male and female external genitalia, it's that genital bud, the purple shows you where the gene is being turned on or transcribed. And you can see all of the patterns for all of these genes that you see lined up in the, um, in the margins here, they all look more or less the same. And that, that was exciting to us because we found this panel of new genes that were expressed or activated in the signaling region in the urethra. And we started systematically, the people who are shown here, um, Ashley Seifert, who was a graduate student in my lab, he now has his own lab at University of Kentucky. Uh, Patrick Chang has his own lab now at uh, Southern Illinois University Medical School. And Brooke Armfield, who's faculty here, started working through functional studies of these genes, looking at where they're expressed in the embryo, mapping them over time. Uh, these are lateral or side views of genital development. And this is our favorite gene, sonic hedgehog which is expressed on one side of the developing genitalia. You can see it here under higher magnification. Here's a series of papers that we published on the functions of a number of these genes. And the one that we were most interested in early on 
was this gene called Sonic Hedgehog or SHH, because when that gene is inactivated, the mice have a complete absence of external genitalia. So a mouse that has two normal copies of the Sonic Hedgehog gene, here's its tail, the labioscrotal swellings, the developing penis here, the prepuce of the foreskin and the glands sticking out. And here is a, a mutant, uh, two mutant copies of the gene that have been inactivated. And it just has this gaping hole, which is really a common outlet for its gut and its lower urinary tract. And there's no phallus at all. So this told us that the sonic hedgehog gene is essential for making external genitalia. And we did some uh, different kinds of genetic experiments that also allowed us to delete this gene at different times in development. And I won't go into all these uh, technical uh, details of the alleles, uh, but what it really means is that we are able to administer a drug that allows the gene to be conditionally inactivated uh, at whatever stage we inject the mother with this drug, it deletes the gene. And what we found is that when we deleted it at early stages, the mice have this gaping hole, this persistence of a cloaca. They don't even make a separate anus and urethra. They just have one outlet, similar to what birds have, and no external genitalia at all. But if we wait a couple of days later in development and then activate the gene, we found that the mice get this defect that I told you about a few minutes ago, hypospadias, this open urethral tube. And these model two congenital malformations in humans persistent cloaca, which is an awful structural birth defect, mostly occurs in girls, where they have one outlet for the urethra, the vagina, and the anus. Um, and at later stages, inactivation of the gene can give us hypospadias. And so as we started systematically working our way through these genes and trying to ascertain their functions, here's another gene that is uh, FGFR2B, that stands for fibroblast growth factor receptor, one isoform of that. It's a secreted signaling molecule. And if we delete the receptor for that signaling molecule, we found that mice developed this open urethral tube very early in development. That's what it should look like. And that's what it does look like in the mutant. And this is a couple of days later when the tissue has enveloped the glands and completely enclosed the urethra. This is what uh, a mouse that has two mutant copies of that gene looks like. It's as if you took scissors and snipped up the underside of the penis and just splayed it open. You're looking right into the urethra here. So we started generating these mouse models for hypospadias. And we started looking at uh, how these genes were regulated. And so this was, um, this was a discovery that I have to say uh, I use as a lesson in teaching. Uh, and it really, it, it will date all of us, right? I mean, it really speaks to the importance of just going over to the library and wandering through the stacks and looking for the article that you um, were after. But also, you know, you find another article that looks interesting and photocopy that one. And this doesn't happen as much with students doing targeted searches online. Um, but I had come across some papers about this gene, FGF receptor 2, being important in prostate cancer, um, just by reading kind of widely and um, discovered that when um, men with prostate cancer are being treated with drugs to stop testosterone signaling, one of the effects of that was it shut down activity of this gene, this fibroblast growth factor receptor. And it was um, being referred to in the literature as an andromeda, meaning that it mediated androgen signaling and prostate cancer. So the mutant that I just showed you in the previous slide had basically feminized genitalia. And it made me wonder whether this gene is also mediating testosterone activity in the embryo. And so we did these experiments um, in which we explanted the embryonic genitalia into a culture dish and we treated the cultures with drugs that blocked androgen signaling, the same drug that's used in prostate cancer. And we found that as we increased the dose of the drug, uh, the signaling or the activity of that gene became weaker until we could completely abolish transcription of that gene by giving a high dose of this drug called flutamide. 
which is a drug that blocks the receptor for testosterone. And then if we add back into the culture, a very potent androgen called dihydrotestosterone, we could rescue, we could outcompete the drug and rescue expression of this gene and relatively normal development. So that suggested to us that this gene might be mediating testosterone signaling even in the embryo. Um, and when we did some informatic analysis of the sequence of the, the gene, we found a short uh, stretch of, of nucleotides that uh, form a binding site for the androgen receptor. So this is in the promoter of the FGF receptor 2 gene. This short stretch of nucleotides is enough for the androgen receptor to bind DNA and activate transcription. So that told us maybe we're looking at a direct target of testosterone signaling. And what we're doing in this experiment by mutating the gene and causing this hypospadias, perhaps the same effect uh, could, could be had if the embryo was exposed to something that blocked testosterone signal, which is what we did in this experiment. And this really opened up a new line of investigation because there had been interest in how these exogenous chemicals that interfere with testosterone signaling could cause disease, including uh, hypospadias. And another benefit, I think, of moving uh, to the University of Florida and, and to this building specifically is just so happened that the Genetics Institute is right across the parking lot. I can see from my window the Center for Human and Aquatic Toxicology, which is where some of the world's uh, foremost uh, experts in endocrine disruption uh, work and have worked for many years. And so we started talking to some of our colleagues over there, in particular, Nancy Denslow, who's also part of the Genetics Institute, about uh, the possibility that we could use this mouse system to try and discover some of the genetic and genomic targets of environmental endocrine disrupting signals. I'll skip over this. And so the reason this is important is that we are awash in environmental endocrine disrupting uh, signals every day in the form of pesticides, uh, fungicides, pharmaceuticals, uh, industrial additives such as uh, bisphenol A, which is something that's found, uh, it's now been taken out of polycarbonate plastics, but it was uh, found in all polycarbonate plastics. It's an estrogen mimic, it binds and activates the estrogen receptor. Now, if you buy a plastic bottle, it probably says BPA free on it. Uh, take no comfort in that. Uh, it's been replaced by another bisphenol called bisphenol S, which has an even stronger estrogenic activity. But no matter, consumers can feel comforted knowing that there's no bisphenol A in their plastic. Also, phthalates, which are softeners uh, added to plastic, they have an estrogenic activity. So it's known from studies in wildlife, from my former colleague Lou Gillette and many others, uh, from studies in fish, from Nancy Denslow's lab, from a lot of rat studies at EPA and other places, that these contaminants can cause structural birth defects, especially of the reproductive tract. How they work is less known about that. So we thought we could apply the power of developmental genetics and genomics to this system and maybe work at this interface of genetics and environmental toxicology and try and identify some of the targets of these endocrine disrupting chemicals in the genitalia. So we set out to do that. And the first question we asked is when during pregnancy is the embryo sensitive, particularly when are the genitourinary organs sensitive to endocrine disrupting chemicals? And so we did this also in mice by looking along this timeline of development and just administering to pregnant mice drugs that antagonize androgen receptor, the receptor for testosterone. And what uh, my student Patrick Jang found and published in, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2015 uh, is that he identified a three-day window of development during which an exposure to that androgen receptor antagonist, whether it's a pharmaceutical antagonist or even an agricultural chemical, can induce this severe uh, uh, anomaly or malformation of the urethral tube. So this is a control mouse penis. This is the penis of a mouse that for only three days of development, its mother, 
It was given an androgen receptor antagonist, and its entire urethra is open, has failed to form the tube. And it's also attached. It has this really big soft tissue tether that causes it to curve uh, and, and be tethered to the body wall. And this curvature is another malformation that's found in humans, it's known as cordy. And here, when you take a section through the, the penis, you can see the urethra actually extends into that soft tissue tether. So it's cordy with the hypospadias. And so having identified that three-day window uh, using chemicals, we then took a genetic approach. And uh, Patrick asked, what happens uh, if we just do a targeted inactivation of that gene at specific stages of development? So you're looking at a normal control male and female uh, external genitalia. This is what happens if we inactivate the androgen receptor at 13 and a half days, which is the beginning of that window. We get a complete sex reversal of the male external genitalia. This is an XY male that has developed effectively a clitoris uh, and complete feminization of the genitalia. Yet it still has testes that produce testosterone. We've only inactivated that gene in the external genitalia. If we inactivate it a couple of days later, just on the tail end of that window, we get another malformation that's known as micropenis or congenital penile um, uh, hypoplasia. Um, and to make a long story short, by doing these uh, very carefully controlled temporal inactivations of the androgen receptor, Patrick found that we could induce the full spectrum of congenital penile anomalies. And if there are any accountants in the, office, in the audience, you'll be pleased to know that we abbreviate congenital penile anomaly as CPA. Uh, all of these CPAs or malformations of the penis can be induced strictly by changing the timing of disruption of the androgen receptor. So if we delete it or inactivate it early, the mice get ambiguous genitalia. If we wait and delete it in the middle of this window, they develop hypospadias, the open urethral tube and cordy. And if it's inactivated at a later stage, they develop micropenis. And I think that was probably why, well, I should also say that um, we then started to try and figure out how this works genetically by screening uh, for large numbers of genes using arrays, screening the genitalia after we gave these uh, androgen receptor antagonists and looking for genes that uh, quantitatively their level of activity was increased or decreased in response to exposure to the chemical. And what we found is that one of the genes that has about a fourfold decrease in its activity after mice are exposed to an antiandrogen is a gene that will ring a bell with you, FGF receptor two. That's the same gene that we know when it has a mutation in it causes hypospadias. Only these mice have no mutations. They're genetically normal, what we call wild type, they're perfectly normal mice, their mothers just happened to be exposed to an androgen receptor antagonist at a critical period of development. And what that causes is this transitory downregulation or decrease in the activity of a number of genes, one of which is this gene. And so thinking about what this might mean in a clinical context, I told you that Virtually none of the kids who uh, present with hypospadias, who then undergo genetic testing, virtually none of them are found to have mutations. Uh, there are some mutations, for example, mutation in the androgen receptor, which causes complete feminization of, of everything. In fact, they look like normal females. Um, but most of the kids with isolated hypospadias, they, they're genetically, appear to be genetically normal. And what these experiments tell us is that it's possible that hypospadias is forming the same way that it's forming in these experiments I just described for you. That um, a pregnant mother is carrying a, an embryo, a fetus, and it's motoring along through development perfectly normally. But then during this critical period of development, an exposure to an antiandrogenic chemical, an endocrine disruptor, could cause this transitory decrease in the activity of this gene. 
And we know if you decrease the activity of that gene, you get hypospadias. And then after the window of sensitivity is over, you know, the expression of the gene rebounds and everything continues normally, the kid is born with hypospadias. You screen for mutations in the genes. There are no mutations. It's because it was an environmentally induced, if you think of it as a, as a volume knob or a rheostat, it was an environmentally induced kind of turning down of the activity of that gene during this critical period of development. And that causes the same phenotype or structural defect that we could induce by mutating the gene. And so we think this is a way of generating mutant phenotypes without mutations. And so we're really interested now in identifying other ways of uh, identifying signatures in kids who have hypospadias, signatures, uh, retrospective exposure events. So maybe epigenetic changes that leave a, a mark that we could detect and then explain to the parents why this, uh, their child has uh, a genital defect when there's no family history of those defects. And then, you know, ultimately, one would hope that could lead to some, lead to some uh, changes in, 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 um, in, in prenatal care. And I'll talk to you about why I think that might be a possibility um, now. So I mentioned this chemical venclozolin to you uh, when I was talking about the drugs that we use to treat these females that led to their offspring having hypospadias. So venclozolin is an agricultural fungicide. Um, it was widely used on soft fruits and ornamental plants um, worldwide. The, the EU banned it um, many, many years ago, and um, the EPA was very slow to ban venclozolin use in the U.S., and actually it's still used, but now it's restricted to use on grass, grasses, which means we're still exposed to it because it's sprayed outside of our houses on lawns, uh, but we're not eating it. Um, nonetheless, vinclozolin has a very powerful antiandrogenic effect. It binds to the androgen receptor, and when mice are exposed to vinclozolin, they get the same kind of malformation they get if they're exposed to a pharmaceutical antagonist of the androgen receptor. This is a normal mouse. Here's a CAT scan showing its nicely enclosed urethral tube. This is the penis of a mouse whose mother was exposed to vinclozolin. It has this big tether, and if you look at it in a slice using the CAT scan, the urethra runs all the way through uh, this big tether and they end up with this hypospadias and, and cordy. You can see it a little more clearly in this uh, histological section. So hy hypospadias is induced in a way that's almost indistinguishable in these mice uh, and, and in mice that we gave a specific drug with the intention of it blocking the androgen receptor. So it's an environmentally induced hypospadias. And using some of the uh, equipment in collaboration with Nancy Denslow over in the toxicology core, uh, in particular using mass spectro, uh, a few different flavors of mass spec she has over there, trying to look at how other steroids change in response to this exposure. We found that one of the things that Venclozolin does is it not only switches off signaling through the androgen receptor, but it even downregulates endogenous production of testosterone. So these exposed fetuses have the double whammy of having their receptor switched off and they're making less testosterone. So it has this very strong feminizing effect on, on the mice. All right, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip a couple of slides here um, that, are, that are really about genetics. Um, and I'll just tell you what we found is that in looking at some of the genes that change in response to vinclozolin, we identified one gene that regulates programmed cell death. And um, cell death is critical for forming a tube. You have to kill off cells in the middle of the tube to hollow it out. And you have to kill off a lot of cells on the underside of the penis to free it up and get an internal urethra. And one of the genes that is changed in response to exposure to this agricultural chemical or to the drug is a gene that regulates cell death. So the exposure causes a decrease in testosterone. It causes a decrease in cell death. So you get persistence of all of these cells that should die, that tether the penis to the body wall and cause this uh, urethral tube defect. 
And so the reason that we think it's important to try and understand the targets of these endocrine disrupting chemicals um, in, in, in the embryo, what are the genes that are being targeted, is not because that's going to help us fix the defect in kids that have hypospadias. The goal is to prevent the defect. So if you know what pathways, what genetic pathways are sensitive to um, disruption, then you can think about ways of buffering those pathways in the embryo. And I included this slide because our model for how this could work is, is uh, folic acid. So spina bifida, uh, you may be aware, is a neural tube or spinal cord defect uh, that also arises in utero by a, a failure of, of neural tube closure. And you end up with this protruding part of the neural tube sticking out of the uh, baby's back, of the spine. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it can be a catastrophic uh, uh, congenital malformation resulting in paralysis and incontinence and, and you know, lifelong problems. Well, since the food supply in the US, the grain stock started to be fortified with folic acid and taking folates became a, a, a recommendation for pregnant women. It's in prenatal vitamin supplements. Even before you know you're pregnant, if you're trying to get pregnant, you start taking folic acid. And that's because folic acid has a very strong preventative effect. It prevents an estimated uh, 1,300 neural tube defects every year uh, in the United States. And this is, um, this is based on studies in mice that showed that spina bifida can be prevented by administering folic acid. And our hope is that by understanding the pathways that are being disrupted by these environmental agents that cause hypospadias, we could reinforce those pathways, perhaps through a nutritional uh, route, a supplement that buffers. We had a candidate that it turned out to, it wasn't the right candidate, but we tried um, supplementing the diet of the mice with this candidate and seeing if we could reduce the severity. And I think it's a matter of time before we find uh, a way of reinforcing these pathways to prevent this one in 126, one in 128 children from being born with external genital defects in the, in the United States. Um, having heard this story, you may be amused. Uh, I personally was irritated uh, by this, but we've been trying to get this project funded for a number of years and in the last round of uh, reviews of a grant to try and understand what are the targets of environmental endocrine disruptors in the genitalia, one of the reviewers said in his written response, written feedback to the proposal, it doesn't matter what the mechanism is. It's just, it's enough that we know that it causes malformations and the effort should be on finding alternative chemicals that don't cause disruption of the endocrine system. Well, that's that's fair enough. If I was an organic chemist, that might be my highest priority would be to try and replace the thousands of chemicals in the environment that cause uh, disruptions of the endocrine system and lead to everything from mammary and prostate cancer to these structural birth defects. In the meantime, you can't get out of your house in the morning without coming into contact with environmental endocrine disruptors in personal care products from nail polish to deodorant to the plastics that your foods are wrapped in. And we all carry around a body burden of these environmental endocrine disruptors um, that affect our biology and our health. And so I think the higher priority should really be on, you know, a cleanup is impossible. Further contamination should be uh, averted. But while we know that every human, in fact, a recent study out of China showed that 50% of the children who were born in this uh, study cohort had detectable levels of enclosalin in their cord blood. When we're dealing with exposure to these contaminants on that sort of scale, I think the emphasis needs to be on figuring out how they work and doing what we can to prevent them. And you know, hopefully in future generations, these uh, new chemicals will become available and, and replace these. But in the meantime, you have to understand how they work in order to prevent them. Okay, so I think given the time, I am going to stop here I was going to talk to you about uh, one other story, but I think it would cut into our question and answer time. So let me just end there and, and thank you for the invitation. And we can have the last eight to 10 minutes for questions, if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Very nice.
And I did have a question in chat from Sarah. Sarah, if you're still here, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, yeah, you can read my question. <laughs> can you? It's right there. Well, I can't the, see it, but someone no, can read it to me. It, it was sent to me, but I'm not sure. It says sex hormones are also synthesized in the adrenal cortex in less amounts than in gonads. Which are genes involved? Are you are you asking what? I don't know what you're asking. Yeah, <laughs> which are the genes involved there? Yeah, so so I'm actually really happy that you asked that question because I uh, we have some work that we published, but I, I didn't talk about today. Um, yeah, so the adrenal uh, the adrenal gland does secrete um, sex steroids and um, overproduction of androgen by the adrenal um, in a condition called uh, CAH or congenital adrenal hyperplasia has the effect of, it's kind of the opposite effect that I talked about, which was about feminizing male external genitalia. In CAH, the adrenal produces all this excess androgen that can masculinize the female genitalia. Um, and there's, um, the mother even gets uh, some clue that this is happening because there's, there can be an increase in, in body hair and some other responses to excess testosterone. So we published, one of my postdocs, Christy Larkins, uh, published a paper uh, it was after the one that I just talked to you about, but it was also in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, looking at target genes that respond in the female to excess androgen um, and showing that the pathways that are activated by uh, excess androgen secreted by the adrenal um, are the same pathways that are involved in normal male external genital development. And that probably explains why these girls are born with these virilized external genitalia. All right, thank you. Thanks for asking that question. Pushpa, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, this was a fascinating lecture. You've really uh, done a lot of explanation of what goes on. Uh, what, do, do, you, do you know what the mechanism is in say, reptiles in which the sex is determined actually by the ambient temperature in which the eggs are uh, incubated? Is so there a similar is, kind of thing, mechanism? It is similar. So um, I, I, I do, and uh, a number of years ago, if I have it handy, let me see. Yeah, so I, I worked on reptiles for my PhD, not on not on genitalia, but I've uh, always been interested in reptiles. And so several years ago, we started looking at comparison of external genitalia in different species. And we, we published this collection of, of five papers that the journal Sexual Development decided to publish it as a special issue. There's one paper on alligator, one on turtle, one on ball python, one on... Um, the old lizard and, and one on birds, um, comparing embryonic development and some of the genetic pathways. And so to make a, a, a long story short, the gene that I told you about at the very beginning of this lecture, SRY, that yeah. is the male sex determining gene, um, its target gene is a transcription factor called SOX9. So reptiles don't have SRY. But it turns out that when you incubate reptile eggs at the male temperature, um, the result of that temperature is activation of SOX9. If you incubate the reptile eggs at the female temperature, they don't turn on SOX9 in the gonads. So it is this kind of environmental or temperature um, input into the same genetic pathway. So mammals start with SRY and turn on SOX9. And in alligators and turtles, they start with temperature, turns on SOX9, and then from there on, the pathway, the genetic pathway is exactly the same. It's an environmental input into the same genetic pathway. And I should add that those discoveries are not mine. Um, those discoveries come from a number of different labs um, that study the gonads, and we've studied the external genitalia. This is a terrific question. And I think it's a fascinating example of how environmental inputs, whether it's temperature or chemicals, can activate or inactivate these genetic pathways. 
may I ask another question? Thank you, sure. that explains it. Uh, the hypospadias, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, that you mentioned, is it always due to uh, malfunction of the androgen receptor? Is that the common thing, whether it's genetic or whatever? No. Um, so we've identified a number of genes that are not part of the androgen, uh, that, are, that are downstream or even in parallel pathways that when inactivated um, can cause hypospadias. So <clears throat> one way of causing it is um, modulating androgen signaling, but there are many uh, genes that are either mediators of androgen activity or act in parallel pathways that are important for tubular morphogenesis, or that movement of the tissue to form a tube. Thank you. You're fascinating. Ken and John, I don't see any other questions or comments. Do you guys have any questions or comments to add? I just saw David in the window. We know each other. Hello. All right. Oh, uh, I think um, this course you're, was amusing at the end when you admitted that you had worked with snakes, reptiles, because this course originally was thought up to be about studies with reptiles. So oh. had, we, had we known <coughs> your interests in this area, we might have given you a broader, more extensive mandate to the terms yeah. of, of the, uh, and, and we may be back to you because we still haven't gotten into the area that we wanted to, to really hit in a larger sense. So anyway, we're highly appreciative of your coming. Uh, John, do you want to make any comments? Yes, all right. No, I, I just want to thank Marty and to, and to, and, and to mention again uh, this uh, article by uh, Carl Zimmer uh, about uh, uh, the, the the sex of birds, which is which is very very interesting, and if you have access to the archives of the New York Times, you can pull that up, and and it's it's really uh, really ex interesting reading. But thank you very much, Marty. Thank you for inviting me, and thanks for your terrific questions. Enjoyed I do, it. I do see one more, Dr. Cohn. I don't know if you have a moment. Yeah, sure. Ramey, go ahead. I just wanted to say it was just fascinating. And I do hope you come again. Um, I'm overwhelmed with the information. I'm excited to learn more and Great. dig Thank into you. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. OK, Marty. Right. Good. Well, we'll see you next time. Thank you for the invitation. Right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll see who we got for a new chair. Okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being with us.